throughout the scriptures of the Old Testament, there is a longing for the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God appeared on occasion, anointing prophets, inspiring particular deeds of service and mercy. You heard just now in the reading from Numbers that Moses himself said, would that all God's people have such a spirit to be able to prophesy. And by prophesy, they mean speak the good news of God. On the day of Pentecost, when they were all together in one place, Suddenly, a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were seated. And they saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the sound, they gathered together. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their own native language. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all of those people who are speaking Galileans? Every one of them. How then does each of us hear them speaking in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Eliamites, as well as residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt and the regions of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own language. They were all surprised and bewildered, and some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them, saying, they're full of new wine. Then Peter stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised up his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people are not drunk, as you suspect. After all, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, both male and female, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness, and the moon will be changed into blood before that great and spectacular day the Lord comes. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here is the reading of God's holy word. God is always faithful to the reading, the hearing, and the doing of the word. So the story of Pentecost is a bit fantastic. There are sufficient delights to churn the congregation's imaginations, enough drama to set worship planners afire, and sufficient confusion to confound even a seasoned preacher. In truth, this over the top tale confronts us with sights and sounds we don't know how to receive. And yet, year after year, we return to the second chapter of Acts in order to reconnect with our with the founding moments of this institution called church. 
I believe this in return is important because Acts 2 is much more than just a fantastic tale. It is a theological declaration as significant today as it was on that first day of Pentecost. That noisy, confusing experience set a theological trajectory, a trajectory for the early church and for the contemporary church. But thanks be to God, Pentecost presents theology not in a thick book, interesting, interesting only to trained theologians, but in a tangible, practical way, by affirming that what our eyes see, what our ears hear, what our mouths speak, matters, spiritually matters. So before we tease out the theological affirmations of Acts 2, let's prepare ourselves. Let us pray. Oh God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, we come to you eager to receive your word today. Send your spirit among us. Quiet all chattering inner voices. <coughs> Relieve us of self-made rigidity. And grant us a fresh encounter with your word. So that by hearing we will believe. By believing we will reimagine. And by reimagining we may continue to be your community of faith and hope and love. In the name of him whom we follow. Even Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, <coughs> theology by the eyes. Have you heard the term visual learner or global thinker? These terms refer to individuals who must first see the whole in order to understand the parts. If you saw the film Hidden Numbers, you witnessed a young visual learner able to see a whole regardless of its complexity and to get the answer almost immediately. I do not know if the disciples were visual learners or global <coughs> thinkers, but the story of Pentecost begins as if they were. So just so we know how this is supposed to work, let me give you another illustration of a visual learner or a global thinker. In the mid-1980s, Intel was about to initiate phase three of their expansion of the Rio Rancho fabrication plant. An engineer from Oregon was recruited to oversee the entire project. Now, in a conversation much later with this, this man, I recognized he was a global thinker, a visual learner. <laughs> he described to me his process. After he had gathered all the information he could, from the highest echelons of management to the folks on the line, he took a folding chair, a cooler with water and sandwiches, and went out to that vacant mesa lot where the plant was to be built and set. He sat and looked at that piece of ground for seven hours until he could see the complete structure, a structure with intricate internal functions, technological advances, and space that was both beautiful and functional. And once he saw the whole, he was ready to begin. His quest for a vision was not is somewhat similar to what the disciples experienced as they waited for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in order to begin their ministry. Yet, unlike that Intel engineer, the disciples' vision was not individual, or private, or personal. Indeed, when it happened, everyone saw luminous flames everywhere. 
as the vision hovered over the glory intensified. But here's the odd thing. No one could see the vision directly above their own Although all sensed the presence of the Lord in this glorious moment, each wondered, am I included? It took the community to say to one another, yes, a light shines over you. Yes, God's spirit is upon you. The church in the new creation was God's spirit resting on others Others would see it happening to but it also required those others to tell us what God was doing in, over, and through us. Now, of course, it is impossible on Pentecost to recapture or reenact such a spiritually profound experience. And still, I hope that you as you watched those petals fall over the youth missioners, and as you saw them descending from the ceiling, from the balcony, I hope you caught a glimpse of God blessing each one of us. When you were looking at the youth, you weren't just seeing a bunch of kids about to go on an adventure today together. But you had the opportunity to see God's own vision of beautiful, courageous, compassionate young individuals. God knows and blesses their potential. Perhaps now, by those petals falling, you do too. The first theological affirmation from Pentecost is formed by seeing another glowing in godly grace and receiving an interpretation that the same is happening for you as well. This is a theological affirmation, and it is intended to shape a particular response. In these days, when terror quickly provokes hatred and fear becomes violence, the church is called by its theology to see others as God sees them. As secular images announce that our world is spiraling, spiraling towards destruction, the church says back, no, not so. While the church recognizes the persistence of sin and does not hide their eyes from the manifold harms and horrors, we still believe that sin is not the final word because God has something better in mind. Where the world sees failure, we see promise. Where the news report cries terror, violence, fear, we see paths that lead to justice, peace, love. Where walls go up, the church builds bridges. Where hatred increases, love multiplies. If Pentecost affirms anything, it affirms that the church as a community drenched in God's vision dare not give up on the hope our eyes have seen. That's lesson one. Theology by my eyes. It matters what and how you see. That's just the beginning of Pentecost. Next comes theology through the ears. With a rush of winds and a cacophony of sound, Act 2 describes the spirit-inspired glossolalia. That means all of the disciples speaking in diverse languages at the same time. The sound must have been terrifically loud drew together a crowd, that script, a crowd that scripture describes as coming from at least a dozen different range regions, and God only knows how many different languages. Now, 
An interesting fact here is that the Romans, you know, the Holy Roman Empire, the power and authority of that day, had a derisive name for all who spoke a language other than theirs. They called such foreign speakers barbarians because their language sounded in Roman ears like bar, 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 bar. So, as the bar, 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 bar was going on inside, outside, on the street, some were ridiculing the disciples' drunkenness, and others were listening. And to those careful listeners, a message slowly emerged out of the bar, 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 inexplicit, inexplicably meaning broke through noise. And some people on the street recognized the message of God's love in their native tongue. Meaning arrived, heart to heart, soul to soul, language to language, culture to culture, hard to explain, but occasionally easy to illustrate. In 1989, after the Young Presbyterian Congregation in Rio Rancho had completed the first task of building their home, their local mission began to expand through the hospitality offered to various community groups. But even with this expanding ministry, the congregation longed for a hands-on mission project greater than the local expression. As they explored a water project in rural Mexico, an opportunity came to host the water project leader, a young man from Mexico who worked between villages and governmental agencies, suppliers, and mission groups in order to bring a well and pipe water pipes, pipes to the water to the community. The congregation planned a day of sightseeing and conversations and concluded with a covered dish dinner, which was followed by a formal invitation presentation. Throughout the day, members and guests ate and sang and laughed and prayed together, <clears throat> and all were quite content. Then the presentation began. Angie, a young woman from the congregation, translated as Roberto showed maps and slides and lined up facts. And then he began to speak about the villages and the people he'd come to know and love. The room felt quieter and quieter until there was complete silence as every ear strained to receive his passion and his pain and his projections and his prayers all were totally connected to Roberto. <coughs> and then, first he, then Angie, then the whole gathered group were erupted in laughter. You see, the congregation had listened so intensely that they understood without translation. Roberto's words went on and on. Angie didn't say a thing, but the spirit was impressing Roberto's meanings on the hearts of the deepest imaginable level. Humbled by their spiritual experience of deep listening, Commitment to the water project was sealed. Although on Pentecost the church was birthed by a common vision seen by eyes, the infant church was swaddled in a blanket of deep listening. The church began and should continue as a multilingual spiritual community. There is no sacred language in the church, nor is there any room for xenophobia among us. This second theological affirmation of Pentecost rings especially loud in contemporary ears where language is often used as a tool to separate and divide. 
Instead, the sounds of Pentecost call the church to continually practice a deep listening, to listen to beyond the human words and languages for God's universal language of love. So first the vision, then the deep hearing, and finally theology by mouth. It's true. On the occasion of the church's birth, there was a sermon. Preachers love that. <laughs> Let me say that again. On the occasion of the church's birth, there was a sermon. But as important as were the words of that sermon was the fact that Peter did not step out on his own to do his own thing. Rather, if you remember, the first sermon was given with the disciples standing side by side. I almost think of them with arms locked together affirming Peter's words as the recital of all of those hours spent studying the scriptures, of the detailed remembering of Jesus' deeds and words, of the patient review of when God's spirit was evident in Jesus' ministry of that commission to go into all the world and yet to wait until the Holy Spirit arrived. On the day of Pentecost, everything that the disciples had discovered and kept within their small, tight group went viral. Peter publicly spoke the disciples' corporate testimony and from that day to this, a public proclamation continues. It continues with robust worship and probing sermons. It continues with creative teaching and daring discussion. It continues through quiet affirmations of hope in the face of frustration by songs sung to new tunes and by young voices raising up old languages. It comes through fervent petitions in prayer and daring deeds of compassion. It comes with every condolence offered to the morning and through all imaginative ministries directed to the poor and always the testimony comes with the faithfulness that refuses to trust in any power other than God. Dearest Church, Pentecost created you with eyes enlivened by a vision to be a community drenched in glory. You were wrapped in a rich blanket of love and language, and your first utterance was a testimony to God's intention to heal, make whole, and save everyone. This is our theological foundation, a theology of eyes and ears and mouth. And since theology sets the trajectory for our living, we must live accordingly. Because according to the story of Pentecost, what we see with our eyes, hear with our ears, and say with our mouths really does matter. Spiritually and practically. <clears throat> now unto God, who by the power of work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we think or think. To God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen.